Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Laya Greeno, and I manage Interactions Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group. Also joining me are two members of the EPE Working Group Advisory Committee, Jennifer Heatner, who's the Director of Global Program Information Monitoring and Evaluation at the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and also Hanin Malala, a Knowledge and Learning Advisor at Oxfam America. We're really pleased to have you all joining us for this first webinar in our Learning and Knowledge Management series. Um, we have two great presentations from the Mercy Corps and International Rescue Committee lined up for you today. Before I introduce our speakers, um, I just want to turn it over to Jen to uh, give a quick introduction to the series and how we got here. Thanks, Laya. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, thanks to Hanin, who we've been working really closely together on putting this together. Uh, this series came out of a small subgroup on learning and knowledge management, and we had an initial group discussion about uh, what different members of uh, the work group were interested in specifically around knowledge management, and came to interest around peer-to-peer um, -peer exchange, sharing experiences, and approaches to knowledge management within and across our organizations. And this is the first in the series of webinars to start uh, creating that space for discussion. So thank you to our presenters, and we're really excited to be here. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, so as I said, we have two presentations lined up for you today. Um, joining us from Mercy Corps is Anna Young, Senior Director for Strategy and Learning, and Brad Sagara from UC Berkeley, who formerly provided consulting services with Tango International, um, but who recently has been working with Mercy Corps on improving the uptake and utilization of evaluation and research findings. And so Anna and Brad will be sharing the findings of that research and what Mercy Corps plans to do as a result. Um, we also have Anjali Shivshanker, Senior Coordinator of Evidence to Action at the International Rescue Committee, who will be talking to us about IRC's Outcomes and Evidence Framework, which is an effort to ensure that IRC is also learning from externally produced evidence. So just so you all know how the webinar will go, um, we'll hear from Mercy Corps first and then IRC, and then we'll, we'll get to your questions at the very end. So just a, a few more things about how this webinar will go. Everyone is on mute and you'll remain on mute for the duration of the webinar, um, but you will be able to ask questions. So these are just a few tips if you want to handle the, um, the toolbar along the, the side or view the presentation in full screen mode. But if you have a question, type your question in the question box um, and then I can pose it on your behalf at the, at the end of the webinar or after the presentations. Um, please feel free to pose the questions at any time as the questions occur to you. Um, and I'll be monitoring those. I also wanted to just quickly say that we will be recording this webinar and sharing the presentations afterwards. So um, don't worry about taking very detailed notes. You, you'll have these resources after. Uh, so with no further ado, Brad, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the presentation. And I think Great, actually, thank you, Laya. Um, Laya, I'm going to take. Oh yes, so, sorry, so Anna's I gonna kick, kick us off and, and yes. That's great. And Brad, if you could just bring up the, the first slide of the presentation, thank you. So, um, greetings, everyone. I am, yes, I'm based in Portland, and um, I'm really pleased. This is really timely um, for us to be sharing this with you, and I'm just going to caveat it by saying that these findings have not yet been broadly disseminated within Mercy Corps, so I'm seeing a couple of my colleagues um, on the, the line who will be learning um, along with you, but we are in the process of planning the launch, and the, um, and so i I'm hoping that some of the questions and the feedback we get will help us kind of do um, a more effective job of the dissemination and uptake. So I'm just going to frame up why we kind of commissioned this research and then turn it over to Brad to share the uh, findings. And Brad, if you can go to the next slide and just share our organizational learning framework. So at Mercy Corps, we've <clears throat> had a commitment towards organizational learning for a number of years and you know, these five pillars uh, kind of show the streams with which we we try to improve our ability to become a learning organization and the 
generating of knowledge and practice and, and learning has been something that we've been really focused on in the past five years. And recently, we identified a gap um, in that that between the the products and the generation of the knowledge, and really seeing the uptake on a consistent basis across the organisation, and realising that that assumption that kind of provide the information and everybody will kind of absorb it is, is clearly false. Um, we wanted to take this part here, take to take a step back and really look at where we were doing it effectively, what the barriers were to this uptake, and then also to look at some of our colleagues and peers and see and learn from them too. Um, and you know, Brad, um, who has been at Berkeley for the past year, um, came forward and, and has been and led this piece of research for us. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad to, to talk through some of the findings. Thank you, Anna. Um, and before I dive into the results, um, I'd just like to take a moment and clarify um, some of the, the parameters and the terminology that we'll be using um, without getting too bogged down in jargon. Um, so as, as Anna mentioned, we are really focusing on uh, explicit knowledge embodied in evaluation and research reports. Um, and looking at how staff accesses and uses this knowledge and ways we can improve the uptake and utilization of it. So just to make the point clear that this, this represents only one part, um, albeit an important one, of an or overall uh, organizational learning strategy. And so with that caveat, um, I'll proceed with uh, some of the, sorry, there we go, enabling conditions um, that we found within the organization. And as Anna mentioned before, it's clear that Mercy Corps really supports organizational learning, and they've demonstrated this with their, their commitment to the supp supply of evaluation and research, and now we're turning more towards the, the demands. And with virtually all of the interviews I conducted, there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, around this. So it seems that this is a chronic pain point uh, for all of the organizations I interviewed. And what this indicates to me is that there's really a, a strong uh, appetite for concerted work uh, dedicated to this space. There are some bright spots within Mercy Corps where evaluation and research utilization is, is really uh, gaining traction organically. So this is evidenced by country action plans, prioritizing, um, applying lessons learned and evaluation, um, and regional directors convening learning events around regionally important uh, topics. So. Of course, there are some challenges. And before I start diving into those, I'd like to share with you this quote, which I feel embodies uh, uh, a frequently mentioned sentiment that sharing knowledge really lacks intention. And while specific tools, uh, mechanisms, processes, they're all important, uh, what's needed is really a coherent commitment and execution of knowledge transfer. And some of the detailed challenges uh, include considerable heterogeneity with uh, respect to the staff. Um, and I found that there are really two important dichotomies that emerged. And this is new hires versus veterans and headquarters staff versus field-based staff. And one of the challenges for new hires is, is the variation uh, in the provision of onboarding materials and training so they don't have the awareness of what's uh, resources uh, are available to them and, and how to access uh, evaluation and research. Another point I can't emphasize enough is the importance of social networks. Um, so often staff mentioned that they accessed reports not through formal mechanisms but relying on emailing someone that they knew within the organization that they knew had done uh, you know work in this particular area and um, new hires don't have this social capital developed yet, and uh, field-based staff might not be privy to uh, higher, kind of a higher level perspective of, of what's out there, what's available, and not to mention uh, difficulties in, in connectivity with, with field offices. Uh, uh, like other organizations, Mercy Corps has a, a large internal database um, where they, they uh, it's, it's like a clearinghouse for, for various documents, including evaluation and research. Um, but it's really difficult to find what you're looking for. Um, and not only that, um, there's, it's often used for recovering documents that you already know exist. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, an effective means of transferring new information, new evaluations, new research, the latest stuff. 
And they also have these virtual communities of practice, which have uh, extremely varying levels of participation. Some are very active posting weekly, and some haven't been active for more than six months. Um, so this has this is a function, you know, it's, it's hard to keep these things uh, active, and it really requires some dedicated indiv individuals. Um, but there's also a clear vision of what the purpose of these communities of practice really are. And my last two points, I think, are really um, among the most important that I found and that the dissemination plans are really, they tend to be ad hoc, they're perfunctory, and this results in poor execution. There's no, there's limited thinking about who the audience is, what they need to know, uh, who's going to be responsible for dissemination, and what, what channels uh, we can use to reach them. And related to this, uh, evaluation reports really tend to be lengthy with limited key messages uh, distilled down. So this is, they're also very context specific, and often driven by donor accountability rather than organizational learning. So a key conclusion I came away with uh, is, is really the need for more intentional knowledge transfer. And the framework that I found um, that's germane to this is uh, John Lavis's five-point framework. And drawing on research in the public health sector, Lavis developed this uh, to facilitate uh, translation of research into policy and action. And I think that this uh, is really salient for uh, internal dissemination as well. So thinking about uh, what evaluations and research, research should be transferred, and it's clear that um, uh, not all evaluations have a high utility elsewhere. Um, and so prioritizing the, the ones that really um, should be disseminated widely and which ones don't necessarily need uh, a large ep dissemination effort around them. Um, and beginning with who your end users are and what their information needs are, what their constraints are, uh, beginning with your end user in mind really increases the chances of uptake and utilization. Formalizing who should be responsible for it um, and, and understanding that that person will change over time and, and by, by project. Um, but in order to hold people accountable, you have to have these formal roles established. These formal roles established. Um, another big focus uh, of the project was how the knowledge is actually transferred. We have lots of different options from um, very uh, passive means of posting it in a, in a, in a database uh, to very interactive means like learning events, face-to-face uh, -face interaction. And we know that face-to-face -face interaction really tends to be the most effective means of knowledge transfer, um, but it's also very resource intensive. So this goes back to understanding what the strategic priorities are to um, see when you need to invest these resources in these, um, in these more interactive uh, learning events. And finally, uh, the big question that I grappled with a lot uh, was what effect uh, should we have? What's, what's the impact of this? And this is clearly um, an area of constant iteration and improvement, and it's very difficult to measure progress and success, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, it's, it's not sufficient to measure um, output level indicators of uh, number of downloads for a document or number of participant and number of participants in a webinar or learning event. Um, we also need to look at higher level outcome measures. And some possible instruments uh, include um, the readiness for organizational learning and evaluation questionnaire that was developed by Holly Prescott at FSG. And there's other uh, knowledge utilization questionnaires out there. So I think more work needs to be done on determining um, how to best measure these higher level outcomes. And finally, I, I found that there were generally four areas of focus um, moving forward, and that is better planning, dedicating personnel and resources uh, to thinking through and prioritizing the research and evaluation areas, uh, reinvesting in your technological infrastructure, um, looking at the, uh, in, uh, the training materials for it, and establishing dis discrete locations for um, evaluation and research with high functional searchability. Um, organizational infrastructure like documentation and processes to facilitate knowledge transfer. So this would be formalizing roles and standards for distilling down key messages and annual reviews of evidence um, and evaluations and research around a certain uh, specific area. And finally, really establishing a culture of where, um, where evaluation and, and research utilization is a norm. And we can look to and learn from countries and regions that have done this organically um, and continue our, the learning events, systematically solicit feedback, and, and look to um, really establish this as a, as a norm. 
And so with that, Anna, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for next steps. And I'm just going to take one minute to talk about next steps and a, a funny kind of moment at the point where it, it really became clear to us how, how, mu how much of a trap this is in that as, as Brad and I and a couple of others were talking about how we put this report out, having been quite excited about the findings and we're like, well, we'll just kind of, we'll, you know, we'll just disseminate it and put it on the DL and realize we were digital library and realize we were falling back into the trap of assuming that this would happen organically. And so we've put together a plan which is going to involve convening some of the key stakeholders um, in knowledge transfer and dissemination in early July and then we're really looking at what are the main cultural ways we can can shift our focus on this and that includes changing a couple of position descriptions to uh, to really bake this responsibility for kind of generating the conversation um, into into people's day-to-day -day, um, work and and looking at ways that we can find hooks within our organizational processes around planning and accountability to create the incentives and the conversations around it um, and then the plan in a year to kind of come back and review where we've got to understanding that this is going to be an iterative kind of process and conversation so realizing that doing this research in and of itself will not change the way we, we work internally so with that um, I will finish and look forward to your questions thank you great thanks so much Anna and Brad um, I will now turn it over to and Julie and then um, we'll, we'll take questions at the end so like I said at the beginning, please feel free to, to send over your questions. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to maximize this. I'm sorry, I'm going to close the. I'm going to close the chat box. So if there's anything that comes up there, um, just let me know. So why focus on translating research to action? So one of the sorry, I'm actually not sure why this slide is not visible um, in the full screen mode. So I'll just keep it there for a second because it's one of the most um, the whole reason why the IRC really cares about making sure that we're translating research into action is because we want to be designing programs that are effective for the people that we serve. And the five outcome areas that IRC has chosen to work on are safety, power, education, health, and economic well-being. So we really want to make sure that because of the programs that we implement, um, the people that we serve are safer, more powerful, better educated, healthier, and economically better off because of the work that we've done. Um, but of course, there are a lot of barriers to translating research into action. We've just heard some from Mercy Corps about disseminating internal results. But in thinking about external of externally available research literature, um, first, there's a lot out there. I mean, in 3IE's database alone, we're looking at almost 3,000 individual impact evaluations, which is great news because it means that we're adding to the research literature every day. Um, but what's difficult, especially for an agency that focuses on implementing programs, is that it's really difficult to manage that volume of literature, to keep it easily accessible, um, to work with it and organize it in a way that the average technical person or program designer can look at it and take away knowledge to use in program design decision making. Um, there are a lot of different types of research sort of across a lot of different types of databases. The quality of research inside databases is quite variable in many ways. And a lot of databases that store research organize the research thematically in sectors or areas of practice as opposed to outcomes. Um, and so what IRC has done is we use gap maps as a tool to organize and store causal evidence specifically. And so 3IE uh, pioneered the gap map approach as a tool. And I'll take you through a concrete example of what a gap map looks like, um, what the features are right after this. But what a gap map does for IRC is it helps us narrow in on synthetic literature, so systematic reviews and meta-analyses that are found across four major databases. Um, we chose the 3IE database, the R4D database, which is a DFID-sponsored database, um, the Campbell Collaboration Database, and the Cochrane Collaboration Database. And those four databases all have either systematic reviews and meta-analyses only, or systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and literature reviews. Um, then we decided to organize the literature according to outcomes, so the five outcome areas, health, power, safety, economic well-being, and education. Um, we presented key information about each review that would influence whether the data found in that review would be used to influence program design. Um, and ultimately, what we wanted gap maps to be used for was to help program design staff identify interventions that do or don't work for a specific outcome. So let me take you to an example. So let me just check quickly. I know that the print will be a little bit small, so I'll be zooming in and out as we go through the presentation, but I just want to make sure that everyone can see this. So if you could just type a quick yes in the chat box. I can see it. Great. 
Um, so this is what a gap map looks like. It's just an Excel file. So we made all of these files solely in Excel. And what you'll see is that across the top are outcomes. So here it's crime rates, recidivism, aggression and violence. And down the rows it's interventions. So interventions for parents with mental illness, interventions for child abuse perpetrators, so on and so forth. Um, and what we've done at the intersection of each intervention and outcome is a study if we found, or a systematic review, if we found a systematic review that's relevant. So let's say we're interested in looking at child abuse and neglect. That's the outcome that I care about as a practitioner. And I want to see what interventions have any type of evidence of positive impact in the settings that I care about. So what IRC did, so first I'll go ahead and just hide these columns to make it a little bit easier to see. And then focusing on child abuse and neglect, all someone has to do is scroll down the rows until they find a filled cell. So we're going through parenting interventions, nothing there, child aggression interventions, nothing there, risk behavior, nothing there. So finally, we get down to parent training program. And we see there are quite a few studies available. Um, and in the studies available, what you can do is go ahead and click on the hyperlink, and it'll open up the full text of the document. So I'll just, I won't open it just right now to save time, but that's how the GAP app is organized and helps make sure that all the research is accessible. What IRC did is that if the literature was publicly available, then we hyperlinked to the source itself. If we had to buy access to the literature, then it became kind of an internal IRC document that we stored. Um, the other thing that we've done is that we can take a look at more details for each of the studies that are found in the tab. Um, so this is what we're calling the bibliography tab. It contains very specific details about each of the studies that are in the GAP map. So one of the studies that we looked at that I just clicked on was the Narrat Al, Parenting and the Prevention of Child Maltreatment in Low and Middle Income Countries it's Systematic Review. So it goes through several pieces of metadata, so it lets you know that it's free for external distribution, the intervention is parenting interventions, it focuses specifically on prevention of violence among boys. The Systematic Review found 12 studies. All of the studies are either experimental or quasi-experimental. Um, and what we found is that there's good evidence of meaningful positive impact in a relevant context, so in a low and middle income country. As you scroll across the row, we have a little bit more data about the specific context, whether it gave any additional information, what population it was focused on, so in this case, youth. Um, and then we gave very specific details about the number of studies, how many, which study designs were included, um, how many studies per study design. And then we have a final column which talks about whether the systematic review did a pooled analysis or not. Um, and a pooled analysis just is what differentiates a meta-analysis from a systematic review. In this case, we see the answer is no. So we don't have a specific percentage through which parenting interventions reduce child maltreatment. Um, but we do know that across the 12 studies, all of them seem to have positive results. So that's a little bit about how the gap map is organized, how the gap map works. So I'll go back to the slides now. So as I said, the gap maps are, were originally pioneered by 3IE. 3IE actually now has four gap maps, one for um, education, one for WASH interventions, one for peace building, and one for safety net interventions. Um, IRC over the past year made a series of 13 gap maps that we then consolidated into five. Uh, according to safety, health, education, power, and economic well-being. Our GAP apps contain about 400 systematic reviews across high income settings and low and middle income settings, um, and 91 protocols. And a protocol is just a systematic review that hasn't yet been completed yet. And the reason why we track the protocols is to be aware of what gaps in the evidence might be filled in the near future. And it took us about 1,000 hours total over the past year. Um, we had a lot of short-term staff help us out with this, um, short-term staff that we paid, and it took about 600 man hours to make the first versions of the gap map, and then probably 400 hours to standardize and update the gap map. Um, and a couple of the key choices that we made, and I think as people make their own gap maps, these are also choices that anyone should make. Um, we focused on synthetic evidence first, so systematic reviews and meta-analyses, um, because we felt those were the most general, those results were the most generalizable across a variety of contexts. Um, and what we've decided to do is only move on to individual impact evaluations where no synthetic evidence exists. Second, we focused on four databases that gave us the highest yield for the time invested. Um, so as many of you will know, uh, certainly a systematic search is meant to be exhaustive. We didn't look at every single database that could possibly have a systematic review. We chose 3IE, R4D, Cochrane, and Campbell as the databases that would give us the most systematic reviews for the number of man hours we had available. And then the last choice we made is that we did include systematic reviews from high income settings. In a lot of the outcome areas that IRC is interested in, there's quite a bit of evidence 
um, on interventions that have been tested only in high income settings. This includes things like keeping children safe from child abuse, for example. It includes social and emotional outcomes for children. It includes a lot of services, um, universal screening for intimate partner violence, for example. And so for that reason, we wanted to make sure we learned from other evidence um, and included it as it was available to us. So acting on the research evidence, as I said, our plan going forward, so right now we have these data maps. We have the evidence organized in a way that we hope is easy for program design staff to use in making decisions. Um, and we hope that by giving people access to the research itself, organizing the research in a more intuitive way, that they'll be able to make evidence-based decisions in program design. Um, what we're hoping to work towards, and this is, I'll zoom in a little bit on this. What we're hoping to work towards is what we're calling this outcomes and evidence framework, where for each given outcome area, so let's say women are protected from unintended pregnancy, we can use the evidence that we found in the gap maps um, and organize it in a way that at a single glance people can understand whether or not there are interventions that do and don't work for a given outcome. Um, and these color codes here essentially signify green is that we have evidence of positive impact in a relevant context, yellow signifies still more to learn about the intervention, and red means that we have evidence that an intervention has no impact or a negative impact. Um, and so this is where we're going over the course of this year. This is our ultimate goal. And so then finally, um, so gap maps are, of course, just one tool that aims to make research literature easily accessible and useful for making program design decisions. And we're planning to use these documents widely within the IRC, uh, but we also welcome anyone using these gap maps in your own work and letting us know how it goes. Um, also, if you've tried something like this in the past, we very much welcome learning from your experience. What was difficult? What was easy? What would you have done differently if you could do it over again? And so with that, I will go ahead and open it up to questions. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Anjali. Um, so we have a, a few questions lined up, um, some clarifying questions for, for both presenters, actually. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll turn to Brad and Anna. And um, the question we have from Mark Niles at Inside NGO is um, whether the, the findings of your study are based on discussions with Mercy Corps or multiple organizations. And I, I know that it's with multiple organizations, but maybe you could say a little bit about that. And also, whether the findings differed um, based on the size of the organization or other factors. So I'll let you all answer first. Uh, I'll let you okay, sounds good. Um, so I conducted interviews with about 20 Mercy Corps staff. Um, so I, I had a really good um, uh, variety of perspectives within the organization. Uh, in addition, I also interviewed one or two people from five peer organizations, um, as well as a, a management consulting firm. And so I can say that this is certainly um, not a representative study. It's just much more of a, an explore, exploratory case study. Um, and the organizations we selected were ones that were also um, a similar size or larger than Mercy Corps, um, that we had good contacts with the right individuals in the organization. Great. Um, so then the, the second question is for Anjali, and um, just a question from Dana Brown at CDA about whether you'd considered using the ALMAP evaluation database. Oh, great question. Um, so at this first test of gap maps, we focus pretty specifically on, or very exclusively, on systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And as far as I know, the ALMAP evaluation database is filled with individual evaluations as opposed to synthetic evaluations. Not that there might not be some in there, but again, that trade-off of time um, versus yield of systematic reviews, we chose to focus on databases that had almost exclusively, or only, systematic reviews and meta-analyses in them. Great. Thanks, Anjali. And you can't see this note from your colleague, Chip Barnett, so I'll, I'll sort of make that comment on his behalf. Uh, he just wanted to mention that there are also, IRC is also planning on using the gap maps to guide a research agenda um, for the IRC to, to facilitate filling in the, in the gaps, um, both with IRC's own research, um, but also from other organizations. Um, so in addition to using the outcomes and evidence framework for, for supporting program design decisions. Uh, so thanks for that observation, Chip. Um, and, and just to stay along this line of questioning, a question from Nadal Curry and McCare about whether the IRC gap maps will be accessible outside of IRC and about how often you anticipate updating the gap maps. 
Yes. So I think in terms of updating the gut maps, we I think we'll probably update them annually, potentially semi-annually. So there's a couple that are actually a year old at this point, so we'll update them again. Um, we're planning to make them available. So we made first drafts available about a year ago, and those are on um, our blog, so I can send those links through. Right now, I think we're pretty close to having them be externally available. We just have to go through and limit the to the article, essentially the full text that we had to buy instead of the ones that are publicly available. But otherwise, we are ready to share them. Great. Um, so this this question is for um, any of you, actually. Uh, so a question from Pesture. Uh, not sure his his organization, so apologies for that. But um, his question is about how you make sure that you're going beyond just knowledge dissemination to actually getting that inf knowledge used by staff, partners, etc. And I, I know that seems to be the key challenge. So would any of you care to comment on that? Um, I, I, I can uh, give an attempt, and I'll let Angelie, um <laughs> Angela, cover any, anything that I might have missed. And I think that you're absolutely right that this is measuring utilization is, is, a, is a constant challenge. Um, and as far as I found it in my research and literature reviews, no one's, no one's really cracked how to do it well. I know that it is unlikely to be able to uh, measure this in terms of how uh, specific project or program outcomes are improved as a result of knowledge utilization. But I do think, I mean, there are, like I alluded to in my uh, presentation, there are um, certain instruments out there that really focus on um, whether or not information was or was not used, and, and specific information, and or specific knowledge. Um, but you know, this, this relies on respondent recall, and there's definitely um, some data quality issues there. So. The short answer is we haven't, I, I don't think there's a perfect measure, um, my, and my best guess is really um, compiling uh, several, uh, uh, try and measure as many different ways as you can. Uh, that's the best we have right now. I have an, I have an example around, which, which is qualitative, but around organizational learning. Um, and when we first did a survey of our teams 10 years ago, and like what the pain points were, um, and one of the things that came up really clearly was across the staff, staff say, we don't have time to learn, which makes me laugh now. But like, it, it was very clear and very consistent across our kind of, you know, staff globally. And when we ran the survey kind of five or so years later, the, the whole tone of the problems and the pain points had shifted. And, um, and, and, and again, it's a proxy, but it was an indication that the culture had shifted um, and the pain points had shifted. And, and we, you know, we recognize that this, you're never going to nail, you know, the, the uptake um, of, you know, of, of knowledge. But if we, there's a lot of conversation that goes on about, about this being a problem. And I, and I think there's a way to kind of like rerun a set of questions once we've really had a push to see whether the pain has moved to a different point in the organization. So I don't know whether that's satisfactory or not, but I think there, there are ways to kind of gauge the culture shift, which is, I think, for, for this significant. And sorry, you, you muted yourself there at the end. Yeah, I was done. Did, did everybody hear me before I muted myself? Okay, I, I think we might have just missed like one or two one or two words. Um, so, just to continue on this line of questioning, um, another question from Chip is the how question is a key one. But did you settle on recommendations for what knowledge transfer mechanisms will be most effective for Mercy Corps, or is that something you're still trying to figure out? Grant has um, provided so a kind of framework of we... recommendations. Oh. Go, go Can ahead, I Anna. jump in on this, Brad? So, so Brad has provided sure. a kind of framework of recommendations, and I think key to the ownership and uptake is going to be pulling in our key leaders to then determine which of those recommendations we want to hit on first. So we we've we've got a kind of a broad framework that, and and we will be sharing this report. Um, broadly for anyone who's interested in it, but digging down into it feels like I don't want that sitting with one or two of us, I want it sitting with the leadership, rest of the leadership in the organization, because I think that is more likely to mean it is then carried out. 
Brad, did you want to add anything to that? Nope. Okay. Um, then I will, we, we have another question from Hanin, one of our, our advisory committee uh, members. Um, and this is for Anjuli. How do staff get access to the Excel sheet? Is it available in a common location that's available to everyone? Um, and depend, I, I don't know how far you all are, but how did you socialize the sheet and let people know that it exists and that, that then they can use it? Um, and then who updates the sheet? Great. So IRC uses a system called Box, which is kind of like a combination of Dropbox and Google Docs, essentially. Um, so right now, all of the Excel spreadsheets are stored there. For right now, only kind of the headquarters technical staff have access to them because that's kind of the first audience that we're going to focus on um, disseminating the gap maps to. We actually just had a meeting with the research team yesterday to get their feedback on how we should do that, when we should do that, um, what's most important. And I think so we haven't exactly done the socializing yet. We have tried to use the, the number of systematic reviews in our work from time to time. But the gap map itself, we're just starting to roll them out or think about how best to do that. And then in terms of the staff who update them, so I have one person working with me. And then over the past year, I've had between four and seven kind of part-time hourly staff who have done the, the actual searching and executing of the search protocols. Um, and so that's who made up like the 1,000 hours, man hours over the course of the last year. Um, the profile of staff actually tends to be, I found that it can be any, it can be very um, inexperienced staff for the most part, as long as they have a good um, core set of skills for internet searching and working with databases and data entry. The rest of it I found has been quite easy to teach in terms of like using a reference manager or filling in the information. Great. Thanks, Anjali. Um, a question back again to Brad and Anna, um, and a bit of background. This question is from Megan Colnar at The Hunger Project. So The Hunger Project has recently conducted an internal survey on organizational learning and put together a working group from across the organization to discuss this. So one of their key findings is that learning is happening very well at the field level, as is rapid adaptation of small program level decisions. But getting that knowledge up and out from the specific field site to other offices, whether age HQ or other field sites has been really challenging. She's just wondering whether that rings true with the interviews that Mercy Corps um, conducted and whether you all have any ideas or advice for improving this process. It seems related to the time issue, that you don't have time to learn or sharing our lessons takes too long. And I, I think you'd be good to answer that. So the, the pain points we see we see a bit, uh, uh, that I think echoes um, the hunger project is a, is a between program. So um, as Brad said, like the quality of learning at the in the field level kind of is is, is mixed, but it's much better than between um, between countries and also sometimes between different programs or different sectors within countries where there's more opportunity um, for it. I think. Um, one, one of the things we have found within our communities of practice is that where you can facilitate a, a con, an initial convening, it then makes it much easier to kind of continue that learning, you know, and, and those conversations once that initial conversation has happened. And yet we also know that those can't, we, we, we can't afford to do those consistently. So I wish we had a silver solution and I'd love to kind of talk offline about some of the findings that you're having. But that, that bridging between programs is important. One of the things we have started to do is to to really promote webinars as a way to kind of dig in on a, on a particular study or evaluation. And we just had one on our Youth and Consequences paper where we're trying to um, cross, kind of cross share information um, and get and and get some of those learnings internalized I had an interesting conversation with one of our technical teams who was saying that some of the, when we have research findings that challenge some of the assumptions and the kind of the usual way of doing business the our, the external environment so our kind of peers and donors and policymakers are, are quite often find it easier to accept those than our internal staff because they've been you know in the field who've been living and breathing a particular set of assumptions and so we know we need to create ways for them to discuss and internalize and kind of and push back um, on, on some of these too. 
Great, thank you, Anna. Um, so we are at the end of our time. I just want to thank our, our presenters again for, for sharing these experiences. Thank you, Anna, Brad, and Anjali. Um, like I said at the beginning of the webinar, I will be sending out the webinar recording and the presentations, and we'll also do our best to pull together the various resources that were mentioned during this webinar to get those to you as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us as well, and stay tuned for the next webinar, which will take place sometime in June. Thanks all.